Um, so at the end of this section, at the end of this section, you should be able to define research data, list research data formats, describe various types of research data, highlight various sources of research data, then classify research data. You should be able to advise on which type of data to apply in your research or in your research. You should be able to use ordinary and nominal research data. You should be able to describe Likert, ordinal, nominal, interval, and ratio scales. You should, be able to you should be able to compare, excuse me, you should be able to compare discrete and continuous research data. You should be able to define research variables and tabular representation. And finally, you should be able to highlight the various methods of research data collection. So these among others are what we'll be discussing in today's section. Again, today, we're still going to continue with the foundational knowledge of all this, uh, all this aspect of our research data. Maybe in our next class, we start our real analysis, but you need to understand the kind of data that are available in order for you to be able to decide the kind of data you be applying or that will be suitable in your research. That's the essence of all this theoretical aspect that we have been discussing from last week. So having said that, when we say research data, how do you describe the research data? We can describe the research data as any information that can be described, or I mean that can be collected, observed, generated, or created to validate original research findings. So now it can also be defined as a collection of facts. When we say facts, kind of data that you collect, information that you collect that has supporting documents that are traceable, okay? Or information from which conclusions may be drawn can also refer to as a research data. Many people think of research, I mean, of data-driven research as something that primarily happens in the sciences, okay? It is often thought of as involving a spreadsheet filled with numbers. That's what a lot of people actually think. But uh, in this case, both beliefs are incorrect because research data are collected and used in scholarship across academic disciplines. Okay, while it can consist of a number in a spreadsheet, okay, uh, it also takes many different formats, which may be it, it, you can collect data in form of videos. You can collect data in form of images. You can collect data in form of artifacts as well as diaries. Okay, so data, when we say research data, we are not just only concentrating on figures alone. Depending on the kind of research you are doing, will determine how to define your own research data. Okay, now for example, a psychologist may be collecting survey data to better understand human behavior, okay? An artist may be using data to generate images and sounds, or an anthropologist using audio files to document observation about different cultures. You see in these three different scenarios, these are three different kind of research data. They are not using the same research data. So because are nat the nature of your research are not the same. Okay, scholarly research across all academic fields is increasingly data-driven, meaning that majority of research you see around today are majorly focusing on, focuses on research. Majority of them are research-driven. That is why when you, when you are discussing about your research, now you think of what kind of data will I be using? How will I collect my data? Okay, so you'll be thinking of how to, what kind of data will you be, will you be collecting and uh, how are you going to collect your data? Okay, all depends on the nature of your research. Okay, but generally this is how to describe what research data is. Then, 
there are several formats, like I said earlier, it's not just only figures, okay? This data may be intangible as in measured numerical variable form in a spreadsheet or an object as a, as a physical research material such as sample of rocks, plants, or insects. All of this can serve as research data, okay? We can have research data in various formats. It may be in document form, which may be in form of text, TXT, or MS Word, or even spreadsheets. We can collect data from what is called lab notebooks. All depend on the nature of your research. It can be field notebooks, it can be diaries. You can collect data from using questionnaire. Okay, it also depends on the nature of your research. It may be transcripts, it may be surveys, it may be code books. You can collect your data through experimental data. Okay, your data can come in form of an experiment, in form of experimental data. We're going to discuss about this in a short while. I mean, more, in, more about this in the social. It can be films, it can be audio or video tapes or files. It may be photographs or image files. It may be sensor readings. It may be text responses. It may be artifacts, specimen, or physical samples. It may be models. It may be algorithm. It may be scripts. It may be content analysis. It may be focus group recordings or even interview and many others. So there's no, you, there's not, there's nothing like your research data must be figures or your research data must be this, must be that. It all depends on the nature of your research. The type of research you are doing will determine the kind of data you will be collecting. Okay? And it can come in any of these forms or format rather. Now, I will say this. Now, we have various types of research data. We have various types of research data. The type of research data you collect may affect the way you manage the data. Okay? Take, for example, data that is hard or impossible to replace. For example, the recording of an event at a specific time and place. Such data will require extra backup procedure to reduce the risk of data loss. Okay, or if you will need to combine data points from different sources, you will need to follow best practice to prevent data corruption. So research data can be generated for different purposes and through different processes. Okay, one, you can have an observational data. This is one of the types of research data. You can have an observational data, which is captured in real time. Okay, and it's usually irreplaceable. For example, it can be sensor data. It can be survey data, it can be sample data, it can be neural images, and many others. You can also have experimental data, which is captured from lab equipment. Okay, it is often re uh, reproducible, but this can be expensive. Ex example of experimental data are gen, I mean, yeah, gene sequences, chromatographs chromatograms, and storage magnetic field data. This is, more or less, this is more or less for those who are in sciences. Then you can also have simulation data. Here, simulation data is generated from test models where model and meta data are more important than output data. Example of simulation data could be climate models and economic models. You can also have derived or compiled data. Okay. Compiled data has been transformed from pre existing data points. Okay. It is reproducible if lost, but this will be quite expensive. Just like experimental data. Examples are data mining, combined databases, as under 3D models. Then you can also have reference of canonical data. This 
corona data or reference data is a static or organic conglomeration of collection of smaller, that is peer reviewed data sets. Okay, so what's it joining? Then most probably published and created. For example, you can have gene sequence data banks, chemical structures, or spatial data portals. So here, yes, please. Um, my research is on real case studies. My question is comes under which real case study? What my real case study? Maybe if you explain. Uh, so what is the meaning of data mining? Okay. What do you mean by this case? Maybe if you explain, then we will understand what uh, you're talking about. Now, when you say data mining, you aggregate opinions or people's view. Then you, maybe you filter out, then from there, you derive some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, uh, inferences or outputs. Okay, but again, it also depends on your on, on on the context. Okay, it depends on its context. Data mining is available in business. It's available in academic in education. It's available in IT. It depends on the. It's it's also available in the health in the medicals. So it depends on the area of your research. Then from there you know how to. Um, how to describe, but again, I'm going to talk more about all this type of data in a short while. But again, if you are talking about case studies, please let us know the kind of real case you are talking about, please. Okay, uh, now, this data will come from somewhere. That's another thing you have to think about after you have defined the kind of data you want to use in your research. Your source of data is also very, very important. Now, you can have your source of data as recording of previous studies. If you get records of previous study, then that can be categorized as a secondary data. Me, secondary data because you are not the one that collected the data. It was only derived from people's or from another person's uh, research work, which is also allow is allowed in, your, in every research. Then you can have a survey. Survey can be a source of data. So, but in survey, you are the one that you are collecting, you are the one collecting that data. So as such, that won't fall under uh, primary and experiment. Please hold on, I'll come back to this. Uh, surveys, another form of source data can be survey. So survey can be categorized as a primary data because you are the one collecting the data, okay? So if you are collecting the data directly, then that one is, uh, is referred to as primary data. And one of the methods by which you can use to collect this kind of data is survey. So survey can be a source of data. Then you have experiments. Experiment can also be a form of a source of data. And of course, experiment is what you are doing yourself, okay? So as a, as a result, that can also be referred to as a primary data. So in any case, sources of data will be experiment, through surveys, or through records of previous studies. Now for surveys, you can have a comprehensive survey, or you can have a sample survey, okay? So I think we discussed about, uh, um, Sample population sample in the last class, so that's what we are defined. That's what we are referring to here. So for comprehensive means that you are surveying the entire population. So, but if you are only surveying a part, a subset, or uh, a representative um, portion of that particular population, then in that case you are using you are using a sample. Okay. So, but in any case. You have your source of data one can be records of previous study or can be surveys or can be experiments. Okay. Now we can further classify this research data into two. One is qualitative uh, data, the other one is quantitative data. 
for quantitative data is mostly numerical. Okay, quantitative data are used when a researcher is trying to quantify a problem or address the what or how many aspects of a research question. That's why you use quantitative data. Then it is, a data, it is data that can either be counted or compared on a numeric scale. For example, it could be the number of third semester students at LUC or the ratings on a scale of one to four of the quality of food served at McDonald's or KFC. This category of data are usually gathered using instruments such as questionnaire, which include a rating scale, or a thermometer to collect weather data. Statistical analysis software such as SPSS is often used to analyze quantitative data. However, on the part of qualitative data, which is mostly on which is mostly on categorical data. Qualitative data describe qualities or characteristics of a particular object. Okay, it is collected using questionnaires, just like uh, just like quantitative data. It can also be collected using interviews or observation, and frequently appears in narrative form. For example. It could be not taken during a focus group on the quality of the food at KFC or responses from an open-handed questionnaire. So these are the differences between qualitative and quantitative data. Now, qualitative data may be difficult to, pre to precisely measure and analyze. Why? Because it appears in a narrative form, unlike quantitative data that is numeric. Now, the data may be in the form of descriptive words, okay, that can be examined for pattern or meaning, sometimes through the use of coding. So coding allows the researcher to categorize qualitative data to identify things that correspond with the research question and to perform quantitative analysis. So what happens here is that sometimes you may have to, let's say you want to capture people's view on, uh, uh, let's say, what's capture people's opinion on something. Then you can say, let me just use this as an example. You can, okay, I think I have an example in the front of other please. In the next slide. Ha. For, quali for qualitative data, you may be thinking, okay, which one should I use in my research? I have another example that's uh, explain more what I was what I was about to say. So let's look at this. Now, you may be thinking, which one should I use in my research, qualitative or quantitative? Research topic may be approached using either quantitative or qualitative methods. Okay, choosing one method or the other depends on what you believe would provide the best evidence for your research objectives. So researchers sometimes choose to incorporate both, okay, in their research, since this method provides different perspectives on the topic. So it depends on the nature of your research that will tell you which one to use. Sometimes you may combine the two. Sometimes you may just use only one. So it all depends on the nature of your research. So for example, you want to know the location of the most popular study spaces in LDS with my campus and why they are so popular. Okay, that's something you're, you're that's, that, that's uh, a research you want to carry out. You want to know the location of the most popular study space in LUC campus and why they are so popular. The first thing you need to do is to identify the most popular spaces. And to identify the most popular spaces, you might count the number of students studying in different locations at regular time intervals over a period of days or weeks. Okay, so this quantitative data will answer the question of how many people study at different locations on campus. Then, after you have done that, to understand why certain locations are more popular than others, you might use a survey to ask students why they prefer these locations. 
So as a result, you'll be using a qualitative, mm -hmm. collecting the qualitative data. So in this kind of research, you may actually combine both methods in your research. So it depends on the nature of your research that will determine whether you want to use qualitative method or approach, or you want to use quantitative approach. And you can still combine the two. It all depends on the nature of your studies. Now, we can further classify this research data into, I mean, for qualitative, we can further classify into ordinal or nominal. Okay? And ordinal can be categories or ranks. For nominal, it can be binary or non binary. And for quantitative, can be discrete or continuous. And under continuous can be interval scale or ratio scale. So let's quickly look at each of these one after the other. Now for ordinary search, this was this is where I was actually pointing out. Now for ordinary search data, it's a kind of categorical data with a set of order or scale. Okay? Ordinary research data is a kind of categorical data with a set order or scale, okay? For example, ordinary data is said to have been collected when a responder input is or a financial happiness level on a scale of one to 10, okay? In ordinary data, there is no standard scale on which the difference in each score is measured, okay? This is to show that the scale is usually influenced by personal factors and not due to a set rule. Okay, take for example, take for example, let's say you gather a group of uh, 100 people who are working, okay? And let's say their salary is between 2,000 to 10,000, uh, $2,000 to $10,000. If you give this kind of if you give this kind of uh, scale, like you want to measure their level of happiness, for example. And uh, for someone who is a student and is receiving something like uh, $2,000 or $3,000 or $5,000, such a person may choose eight or nine or 10, consider that he's very happy, okay? Because the money may be really big in his press, in his, in his, in his, in his, in his to him, the money may be a big one. But if you give the same question to someone who is a family man, okay, and uh, the person is receiving about, uh, let's say about $7,000 or $8,000, okay, the person may be choosing two or three, okay, because of his own responsibility. So it varies from person to person. Okay, and that's why we say there's no standard scale on which the difference in each score is measured. Now, for example, under this ordinary research data, you can have agreements. Under agreements can be strongly agree, disagree, neutral, agree, or strongly agree. Okay, disagree, uh, disagree I mean, degree or severity of illness can be mild, can be moderate, can be severe. Okay, these are examples of ordinary research data. This is how to collect ordinary research data. They can be written in terms of excellent, good, fair, or poor. Then frequency can be always, often, sometimes, never. Then can be classification, where you have first, second, third, and so on. Then can be level of education, which could be primary, secondary, tertiary, and, and, and so on. It could be great. Excuse me, A, B, C, D, E, and F. So whenever you are using or you come across something like this in terms of Malara. Whenever you come across um, something of this nature, any data of this nature, know that you are talking about, you are dealing with ordinary research data. Always remember the first thing is, ordinary research data is a kind of, it's a kind of categorical, categorical data with a set order or scale, okay? 
So whenever you remember that, you will know that this is, whenever you come across something like that, you know that you are dealing with ordinary research leader. And you can have daily life, tolerate, like, like a lot, loved. Okay? You can have strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Okay? I'm still going to say something about this now. Then we also have what is called ordinary scale. Okay? The ordinary scale includes statistical data type where variables are in order or rank, but without a degree of difference between categories. Okay, the ordinary scale contains qualitative data. So it, place, it places variable in order or rank, okay? Only permitting to measure the value as higher or lower in scale. It doesn't measure the difference. It doesn't measure the difference. Let's say you, 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 you either score one or two. You cannot score 1.5 or 1.8. So even if it's called 1.2 or 1.3, it will take it to one, okay? But if it's called 1.8, maybe, depending on how you are footed, then it may put it to maybe two. Maybe let's say if you round it up. So it doesn't measure the difference between the two. It only measure the absolute value. Maybe one, two, three, four, five. So now, you can use an ordinary scale for research and so we propose to understand the lower, I mean, the higher or lower value of a data set. Okay, the scale identifies the magnitude of the variables. So it does not explain the distance between the variables. That's what I'm saying about the, the gap, the interval between these two variables. Okay, it doesn't explain the distance between the variables. The ordinary scale cannot answer how much, how much different the two categories are. Then, like a Likert scale, the ordinary scale can measure frequency importance, satisfaction, likelihood, quality, and experience, and so on. So the measures in ordinary scale do not have absolute value as the real difference between, the real difference between adjacent value may not have the same meaning. So for example, the values in the H scale less than 20 and 20 to 50 do not have the same meaning as 50 to 80 and over 80, okay? These are two different things. Then you can also have an example of uh, ordinary scale, something like, can have something like, how can you read your knowledge in Excel? You can have advanced, intermediate, basic, novice, zero. So you either have zero or you are a novice or you are a basic or you are intermediate or you are advanced. There's nothing like I, I'm advanced, but I'm, I'm more than basic, but I'm not, in, I'm, I've not gotten to intermediate, no. And in the real sense of it, you may actually be more higher than basic, but it doesn't check for the, for, for the interval, okay? You either be advanced or intermediate or basic or novice or zero. So that is that on uh, ordinary scale. Then we also have Lincoln scale. This is what can be used to check, to, 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 to capture ordinary data. Now, Nika scale is a point scale used by researchers to take surveys and get people's opinion on a subject matter. So it is usually a five or seven point scale with point that range from one extreme to another. Of course, you can have four point scale, okay? But generally, it is always five to seven. And it also depends on the nature of your research that will determine how you are going to define your scale. So take for example, how satisfied are you with our meal tonight? You can have one to be very satisfied. You can have to be somewhat satisfied. You can have to be neutral. You can have four to be somewhat dissatisfied. I can have five to be very dissatisfied. Okay, then you can also use icon emoji like this. Okay, so it depends on how you have. Uh, and this is what they're actually using in some of these um, efforts. For example, if you go to a KLIA, if you go to any of their workshops, as you're coming out, you can just, you know, tap on whichever one that suits based on your experience. Okay, so 
uh, also, if you look at four points, if I decide to add this thing because this one you can come across all these four point liter scale as well in some papers. Now, a four point liter scale is basically a forced linker scale. Why did they call it forced? Because they force you to either support or disagree. You cannot say neutral. Okay. That is why they call it a forced. That's why they call it a forced uh, linker scale. The reason is the reason it is named as such is that the user is forced to form an opinion. Okay, and there is no there, there's no safe neutral option. So it is mostly used by market researchers to get specific responses. Okay, yeah, this is also fine. This is fine, but again there will be some uh, degree, there may be some degree of uh, errors. Of course, there's no research that doesn't have a degree of error. That's why we always have uh, all this 0 0.5, whatever. When we get, when we get to analysis, we, we get, I will explain that to you. But you can use this, you can use five points or seven points, depending on it. And you can use four, either way. Anyone you use in your research is acceptable. Okay, you are the one that know what you want, and as long if it is four that suits your need, apply four. If it is five that suits your need, apply five. If it is seven, apply seven. Okay, so it depends on the nature of your. And for four point, you can ask something like, "How much do you agree or disagree?" You can strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, or strongly disagree. Okay. Now we have nominal research data as well. Now, for nominal research data, it's a type of data that is used to label variables without providing any quantitative value. Okay? It is the simplest form of a scale of measure. Unlike ordinary data, nominal data cannot be ordered, okay? And cannot be measured. Nominal data cannot be manipulated using available mathematical operators. Thus, the only measure of central tendency for such data is the mode. So for nominal data, nominal data can be both qualitative and quantitative. It depends on your, uh, your on depends on, the, on, on, on your research, on the nature of your research. However, the quantitative label lacks a numerical value or relationship. That is, identification number. On the other hand, various type of qualitative data can be represented in nominal form. They may include words, letters, symbols, names of people, phone number, address, gender, and nationality. Okay, a type of categorical data without an essential order is also known as, I mean, nominal research data can also be described as a type of categorical data without an essential order. Now, unlike the other one that we have uh, disagree, uh, strongly disagree, disagree, neither or neutral, then agree, strongly agree. Another one has a particular order. But in nominal case, it is not like that. Okay? It doesn't follow any form of order. For example, just consider the two questions that you can say. One, how was your customer service experience? Okay? How was your customer service experience? So in this case, whoever your respondent may decide to write out what they feel, okay? At the same time, you can still present the same, the same question like this. How was your customer service experience? Are you give options? Good, neutral, or bad, okay? The data to be collected from question one, which is this place, is a nominal data. While that of two, which is this one, is an ordinal data because it follows certain order okay so this is the difference but in some cases you may you know combine the two it depends on the nature of your research then also you can have uh, um non-binary data other displays can also be uh where types of cars it can be proton saga proton wearer blah, blah, blah. then um 
ethnicity, it can be Malay, Chinese, India. Then uh, you can also have binary data, which may be smoking status. Can be smoker or non smoker, disease status, disease or normal. You can have status of student, undergraduate, or postgraduate. But basically, binary data is known as the dichotomous, and if they're always two. But in this case, this can be a nominal data, okay? Or, but it also depends on how you present it to your respondents, okay? If you have presented it to your, to your respondent in a tool, in form of this tool, this question tool, then you'll be collecting ordinary data. But if you have presented it in, in form of this question one, then you'll be collecting nominal data. So in any case, you can still combine these two in your research. It all depends on the nature of your work. Now, we also have nominal scale, okay? Nominal scale uses tax or label to associate value with the rank, okay? So it differentiates items based on the categories they belong. The nominal scale do not depend on numbers because it deals with non-numeric attributes. Take for example, in the marathon race, all the contestants are given a number, right? These numbers are for the purpose of identifying the contestants. The numbers don't have any association with the results of the race or with the characteristics of the person. Okay? A nominal scale can have both qualitative as well as quantitative variables. For example, religious affiliation, gender, country or city of origin, marital status, and so on can be considered to be a type of nominal scale. So example of nominal scale can also be gender, like I said earlier, can be M for male, F for female. Can, can be here, what is, your, what is your air color? Okay, can be brown, can be black, can be blonde, can be green, can be other. Okay, all these are examples of nominal, uh, nominal variable or question. Okay, so now, we also have discrete research data. We also have discrete research data. Discrete data is a count that involves integer. A count that involves integer. Okay, only a limited number of value is possible. So this type of data cannot be subdivided into different parts. Discrete data includes discrete variables that are finite, numeric, countable and non-negative integers. In many cases, this key data can be prefixed with the number of, the number of, the number of, that in many cases, in many cases. So for example, you can say the number of PhD students who have attended the class. That's an example of this key data. The number of customers who have bought different products. The number of groceries people are purchasing every day. This type of data is mainly used for simple statistical analysis because it is easy to summarize and compute, okay? Then in most of the practices, this key data is displayed by bar charts, stems and leaf plots, as well as pie charts, okay? It can be number of eggs in a basket, number of kids in a class, number of Facebook likes, number of diaper changes in a day, number of win in a season, number of votes in an election. Okay, then you can have something like five kids, six workers, three laptops. Then we also have continuous data. So let's look at that in the next slide. Now, for continuous research data, it's data that can take any value. Okay, height, width, temperature, and length are all examples of continuous data. Some continuous data can. Uh, so continuous data will change over time, such as the weight of a baby in its first year, or the temperature in a room throughout the day. Okay, this data is best shown on a line graph or skills and histogram, as this type of data, I mean, as this type of graph can show how the data changes over a given period of time. Other continuous data, such as the height of a group of children, on one particular day is often grouped into categories to make it easier to interpret. The numbers of continuous data are not always clean. 
and integers as they are usually collected from very precise measurements. So if you look at this place, discrete data can be counted. Continuous data can be measured, okay? So in this case, continuous, continuous data here are the temperature of each of the day. Why discrete data, which are quantitative data, are the days, the days of, uh, the, days of uh, of the week. Is that this is just the continuous data. Please hold on, okay? Now, in this graph, the days have been counted and the temperatures have been measured. Okay, so now the, for discrete data can be data that can be counted, that are countable, while continuous can be measured. Okay, so now we also have interval scale. Okay, interval scale. An interval scale can be defined as a quantitative measurement scale where variables have an order. The difference between two variables is equal and the, pre and the presence of zero is arbitrary. So it can be used to measure variables that exist along a common scale in equal intervals. Interval scale are best suited in surveys where respondent must enter values regarding temperature, time, and dates. Okay, interval scale can be easily integrated into multiple choice questions or rating scale question by asking respondents to use a, a numerical scale to make a rating. Example of this can be net promoter's score service measures likelihood of customer recommending a company's product or services to others. Okay, so it does so by asking them to rate their likelihood to do so on a numerical scale from zero to 10. So where zero indicates they are not likely at all, and 10 indicates they are very likely. So this can be an example of an internal scale and it can be something like this. How likely is it that you will recommend this company to a friend or colleagues. Zero, not at all likely. You can have all these other ones, and S10 will be extremely likely. Of course, you have to quote each of these inside your analysis uh, analysis uh, software, whether you're using R or you're using FPSS. So when they choose for, it has a particular, it has a particular meaning, it has a particular point. Then on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being not at all likely and 10 being extremely likely, how likely are you to recommend this product to your friend? So you can also formulate your question like this and have this kind of a scale as your internal measurements. Now, we also have ratio scale. For ratio scale, it's a type of variable measurement scale which is quantitative in nature. Okay, it allows any researcher to compare the intervals or differences. So ratio scale is the fourth level of measurement and possesses a zero point of character to origin. I mean character of origin. This is a unique feature of this scale. When we say the fourth scale, we have nominal scale, ordinal scale, interval scale, and ratio scale. For example, the temperature outside is zero degrees Celsius. Zero degree doesn't mean it is not hot or cold. It is just a value. So a ratio scale is the most informative scale as it tends to tell about the order and number of the objects between the values of the scale. The most common example of this scale are height, money, age, weight, blood pressure, and, uh, and the likes. So with respect to market research, the common example that are observed are sales, price, number of customers, market share, and so on. Okay, so here we have four scale, and one of these four scale is ratio scale. Then again, 
When we compare discrete and continuous data, both data types are important for statistical analysis. Okay, however, some major differences need to be noted before drawing any conclusion or making decision. Okay, one, discrete data is the type of data that has clear spaces between value. Continuous data is data that falls in a constant sequence. Okay, discrete data is countable why continuous data is measurable, okay? To accurately represent discrete data, a bar chart is used. Histogram or line graphs are used to represent continuous data graphically. I think that has answered your question. continuous data, okay? So histogram or line graphs are used to represent continuous data graphically. Then a diagram of the discrete function shows a distinct point that remains unconnected. While in a continuous function graph, the points are connected with an unbroken line. Discrete data contains distinct or separate values. Continuous data includes any value within the preferred range. These are just some of the differences, some of the, if you compare discrete and continuous data. But I think the one that is that may, that may kind of interesting to you is how do you represent this data? So if you want to represent the discrete data, mostly most researcher uses bar graph. But if you are going to use continuous, if you want to represent continuous data, then use histogram or line graph, which we'll be using in some of our analysis experiments or uh, analysis samples. So if you want more about this, you can check this picture, which actually summarizes some of this comparison, okay? Now, data set and data tables. A data set is a set of, is a set of collection of data, okay? This set is normally presented in a tabular pattern. Okay, every column describes a particular variable. That's why you have something like this. This rating numeric, you have sub numeric, you have mass numeric, you have val uh, value numeric, you have price. Numeric you are seeing here is the data type. Um, it says the kind of value that will be stored inside this particular variable. Okay, the numeric you're seeing here are just data types. So the name of the variable itself is rating, survey, mass, value, and price. Okay, now, this, every column describes a particular variable. So this is a variable, 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 and these are the association value. Okay, now, each row corresponds to a given num to a given member of the data set as per the given question. So this one, for example, what you're having here is information you get or response you get from, re from the first respondent. Second respondent gave this 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 uh, values and so on. Now data set describe values for each variable for unknown quantities such as height, width, temperature, value, it is of an object of values of random numbers. So the values in this in this set are known as datum. These are datum, what you have inside this uh, orange color. Then the data set consists of data of one or more members corresponding to each row. This is, these are data sets. Okay, now the data table itself, a data set organized into a table with one column for each variable and one row for each person. Each person in this, in this case is for, referred to each respondent. Okay, each respondent, the person that responds to your survey. So this is what data set really means. And this is what data table is. So data table comprises of variables, which actually 
the hole up, okay? And what you have inside on your row are the correct correspond to a given member of that particular data set. And these are the information, these are the response you get from your from your from your target group or whoever you are uh, administering your whatever you're collecting your survey data, whatever you're collecting your data from. Then definitions for variables and typical data table. Now this is just an, another example of a data set. So now here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight variables. Okay, this is OBS, this is A, this is BMI, this is F, F norm, temperature, gender, exercise level, and question. So before you can have your table, you must define your table. I mean, you must define your variables. And when you define your variables, you'll be having what is called data dictionary, where you define the name of your variable, the kind of uh, the size, the kind of values, the, you have to specify the data type, and you also have to specify the measurement scale, whether it is ordinal or nominal or... Uh, Anyway, you need to specify your measurement scale and few other details. Then here, sometimes here also you have to define some values. If you look at um, if you look at gender, you can see on that gender field you have zero one zero one zero one zero one. So depend on how you have coded your your how you have defined your variable rather. So zero may be representing female or male, depending on how you have define your variable. But whichever value you have choose here doesn't have anything to do whether, um, it doesn't mean that whether because you are using one for male, male is higher. Or before you are using zero for male, uh, because you are using zero for male, male is lower. No, you are, it just, you are just using to represent, you are just using to represent a particular input. Okay? And same goes to exercise level as well as question as well. So now, some of the things that you may actually do, do, you may actually do here is that for the age, age will be in years. You can have information about age, then you can have a description for this particular age as age in years, and of course the data type uh, may be will be integer. Then BMI, body mass index, can be weights or height square in kilogram. You can have all this information. Then FF norm, the average number of times eating fast food in a week. Then temperature, which is high temperature for the body. Gender, one for female, zero for male. And then exercise level, one for low, three for medium, and I mean two for medium, three for high. Then question, compared to others, what is your satisfaction rating? of the National Practitioner, excuse me, data bank. One can be very satisfied, two can be somewhat satisfied, three can be neutral, four can be somewhat dissatisfied, and five can be dissatisfied, okay? So this is how you can actually uh, define your variable, and of course, put some kind of description about what the variables really means and what kind of value they will be taking. Then of course, we're still going to do all this thing, but I'm just showing you what you need to do. So whenever you see, and whenever you come across a table like this, know that they need to, they must have defined some kind of information about each of those variables somewhere inside the analysis. For you to be able to understand what is happening here, you need to get in touch with the data, with the data dictionary of that particular data of that particular table. Now, we have various methods to collect your data. Then again, it also depends on the type of the nature of your research that will determine the kind of data or the kind of method you'll be using. One of the methods that can be used to collect data is through experiments. You can collect your data through experiments. And uh, when do you use experiment to test a casual relationship? So how, to, how do you collect this kind of 
data, you can manipulate variables and measure their effects on others. Okay, then another method is to survey. When we use survey to understand the general characteristics or opinion of a group of people, okay, that's when you use survey. And how do you do this? You distribute a list of questions to a sample online or in person or over the phone. But here, there are some things which I believe probably they must have uh, taught you or discussed discuss with you in your Saturday class. To decide, to design your survey, you have to make sure that your question inside your survey answers your research question. Okay, your question in your survey must answer your research question. But that's the, that's the goal, that's the end goal. Okay, so make sure you do it properly so that you'll be capturing the correct data. Now, interview or focus group. This is another method by which you can use to collect your data. Like I said, it also depends on your, the nature of your research. So when do we use this? to gain an in-depth understanding of perceptions or opinion on a topic. So this can be a one-on-one -on -one kind of interview, maybe with someone, maybe with a CEO of a company or with, or with a veteran in a particular field, okay? Then you can apply this kind of, this kind of method. Then, how do you use this method? Verbally has participant open-ended question in individual interview or focus group discussions. Then you can also have observation. You can use an, you, can, you can follow observation method. So when do we use this to understand something in its natural setting? Again, okay, and how do you do? You measure or survey a sample without trying to affect them. Okay. So we also have ethnography. So here to study the culture of a community or organization firsthand. Okay, how do you use this? You join and participate in the community and record your observation and reflections. You can also have archival research. So here, to understand current and historical events, conditions, or practices. Okay, so how do we use this? Access manuscripts, documents, or records from libraries, Depositories, actually, this should be repositories or the internet. Okay, then you can have secondary data collection. Okay, here to analyze data for population that you can't access firsthand. That's when you use this kind of secondary data collection. So, how do we use this? Find existing data sets that have already been collected from sources such as government agencies or research organization. So with that, you can run your analysis and, you know. So, but in any case, you have to carefully consider what method you will use to gather data that helps you directly answer your research questions. So it all depends on the nature of your research that will determine the kind of method you will be using. You can use experimental method, you can use, you can collect your data to survey, you can collect your data to interview, you can collect and you can use observation method, you can use ethnography, you can use archiver, you can use secondary data collection. The choice is absolutely yours. Then that is all for today. So if you have any questions, I think I can attend to them now. Uh -huh. So, uh, which statistical analysis use in continuous data? Like I said, you can use histogram to to to, to present your continuous uh, data. I think that one I've already talked about it just now. Then, uh, mine experiment, mine experiment. Uh, what was your question initially? 
My research is on real case study. My question is comes under which the my experiment. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, I misread. Mine is experiments. Okay, 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 okay. Mine is experiments. So then if it's experiment, then that is how to collect your, your data. So, uh, yeah. okay. any other question, please? Uh, what I'm uh, trying to ask here, my uh, research is, is on a case studies. I'll be doing a case studies of my clients uh, with some parameters. So it comes under what is experiment? No, 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 no. Case study. That is survey, right? Not survey. I'll be doing a live case study. Live case study. Means, yeah, I will be giving some parameters to my clients uh, for six months. Uh, after that, giving some parameters, I will be uh, jotting down the outcomes. That's observation, right? Observation. It's not an experiment. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hmm. okay. So, any other question, please? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm doing some uh, survey, but not directly uh, under my leadership. Uh, from my office, we are engaging the government partners now to conduct the survey. Can I use that? Can I consider that secondary, or how do I consider that kind of survey? No, you you had the one. Data? You are the one conducting the survey, right? It's not that somebody have collected the data. I want to use the data. Remember, remember, in us in I think three or four classes. Uh, ago, with I showed you a particular site where you can go and download some research data. All right, those kind of data are secondary research data because you are not the one that collected them. But the one you are talking about now that is being done by your organization is a primary data because you are you are going to the field and collect your data directly. That's a primary data. Yes, I understand, but I'm not going directly that you collect the data, but what I'm, I'm managing that, giving the fund to the government and the government will conduct and under our supervision, under my supervision. That's still, that's still, that's still primary. Okay. Okay, very clear. Excuse me, sir. Hello, excuse yes. me, sir. Yes, please. Hello, Assalamu alaikum, sir. sir. Yes, well, sir, can you hear you? Yeah, sir, I just want to ask that the word, uh, when we are putting these data in SPSS and we, we have to go for the analysis. So we have to go for uh, what type of description we will be going and making inferential about that. Uh, actually, see, description is just to, you know, in the, in, at the end, if you revisit your data, will guide you why you created that particular variable, okay? It has nothing to do with your analysis. But later, okay. you understand this. We are still going to run all these things on SPSN. So just go down for a while, okay? Then you okay. see, I'm going, you, I'm going to take you through the major, the, the, the basic aspect that must be filled that can okay. affect, that can have effect on your analysis results. Okay, I'm going to show you that okay. one. But description, it just only tells you, give information about the variable. You can put, you may not put, it's okay. But there are some points that you have to define, especially when you're talking about um, uh, categorical variable, whereby you have to uh, represent certain input with, in, with figure. Take, for example, gender. One for female, zero for male, something like that. So those kind of definitions you must define them clearly so we are going to see how those how those kind of things can be done okay just hold on for okay. a while okay uh so my Thank you. study welcome uh my study is cross-sectional what my cross-sectional maybe if you explain to us hmm? yes sir 
Yes, please. Should I go to field? So, sir, should I go to the field to field organization or institute to collect data about my project, sir? Should you do what? Should I go to or should I visit the field, the organization or institute to collect data about my projects? Of course. That's why the first thing you have to first do is that you have to remember I told you. Planning is very important in every research. You must identify the kind of data you want to collect. You must identify your target group, and you must identify your data collection method and where you will be collecting your data from. Yes, data collection if method. Those, if, those, if, those, if those areas are not feasible or achievable, change your research work. Yes. Otherwise, if you if you if you choose a research that the data is not available, at the end you will not achieve anything. Or the data is the data the data, the research, the data you want to use for your research is not accessible. That's what I mean. So, but as long as you know where to get your data, you know how to collect your data. Why not? You can approach them. The highest, the highest you can do is that probably you may need to collect letter from the school, something like um, an education letter or introduction letter, okay? Because some organization may want to, may need you to, you know, identify yourself to be sure that whatever data they are releasing for you is meant for, is going to be used for the purpose you claim you are using it for, okay? So probably you may need to, you may need to, you may need to, collect a letter of introduction from the school. You can request for that from the CPS or from your supervisor. So they will know how to get you such letter. Okay? Yes. Or yes. if you have, unless, unless if you have direct, if you have a direct uh, link with the organization, then you can just talk to them. If you know that they will not ask you, they will not question you, or they will not question you on this, then it's okay, you can approach them and collect your data straight away. The attendance link has been shared, so please check the chat box. Uh, professor. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. I, I, my study is, I'm going to use mixed methods. Eh? Mixed methods where I'll, I'll have to interview, then I'll have to give questionnaires. In that kind of, uh, uh, what kind of skills should I, should I apply? Now, now, see, whether you have applied whether you have applied quantitative or qualitative or you mix everything to collect your data, when it comes to analysis, you have to create variable to represent each one after the other. So you are going to assign measurement scale based on that particular variable, not based on the entire questionnaire. Okay, so your your, your, what they call it, your, your, your variable, let's say for example, I'm just giving an instance. Inside your questionnaire, you have a place where you're collecting variable for gender, yes. okay? Yes. So that's a form of, that's a kind of categorical variable, right? So in such case, you can have, you have to choose, you have to choose, uh, you cannot choose, um, sorry. Is that from you? Sorry. Okay, okay, yeah, sorry. Aha. Uh -huh. So as a result, you choose the appropriate, you choose the appropriate measurement for that particular variable. Okay? The, the, very, the, the measurements will be for each variable, not for the entire questionnaire. So that's why you can, you, can, you can combine the method to collect your data, no problem. But when it comes to analysis, you have to bring them out because there's no, there's no provision for mixed mix, uh, mix measurements on the analysis tool. Okay, you have to, but don't worry about that. When we get to, the statistics part, I mean, the SPSS part, you see how this can be done, okay? Just continue collecting your data, and once you collect your data, you will see how those 
uh, data can be represented and how the measuring scale can be assigned. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, any other question, please? Excuse me, sir. Yes, please. Excuse me, sir. Sir, I just want to ask that uh, knowledge, skills, and attitude are will be providing the continuous data that, like we will be saying them that 87 percent people are having that type of knowledge and 78 percent people have the skill related to the topic. So this is a categorical uh, category, uh, categorical data and the continuous data, right? That's continuous. Yeah. So the yes. knowledge, skills, and attitude will be the categories. Yeah, because it varies from person to person. Skill, 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 skill. Somebody have a particular skill. Yeah. He has it. It cannot be unless you want to measure it. unless you want to measure the level. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 I will be measuring the level of their knowledge, skills, and attitude. So they will be reporting. So these all three will be the category categories of the knowledge or skills and attitude, and the data will be provided by them will be a co continuous data, right? Definitely, yes. Oh, thank you. Section of the continuous methodology for collection. Section of the continuous methodology for collection of data. I still don't understand what you mean by. I want to know your your focus when it comes to cross-sectional study. Only then I will be able to tell whether you can use uh, questionnaire or you can use. Of course, data survey. What do you mean by data survey? You are talking about survey. That survey can be a, survey is a questionnaire, right? So I need to I know think, your your I think, your. I yes, think, I think Professor. I think he, she's trying to she's trying to to mean that he, she's going to use both methods, quantitative and qualitative methods. So if it's uh, no problem, it it all depends on you can use. There's no crime, okay? There's no crime. You can use as long as that is what we answer your research question. So once once it answered your remember, like I always say you are the sole administrator of your project, of your research. What matter most is your presentation. Okay, you should be able to present it well. I must be able to follow a scientific, a scientific method. Okay? As long as you follow a scientific method and uh, you were able to present it well, nobody can stop you. But if you cannot present it well, and you have not followed the scientific method, only then you have issue. So if you know that this is what you want to do, that's the first thing. As long as you understand what you are doing, what you want to do, then use any of this approach to collect your data. Once you use, then you apply any of those, uh, one of those methods to collect your data, you have already used a uh, scientific method. But again, under your chapter three, you need to you need to explain the reason why you chose that method and some research works where those methods have been used in the past. So you have to explain all these things. I have to put some kind of uh, literature, literature backup, I mean, some citation to back up your claim. Okay, but make sure that you are using recent references in this regard. Okay. So once you can do that and it's work with your work, it's okay. Then it's fine. So me, I think that is yes, please. Sir, I want to know about uh, PhD topic. If a topic is selected uh, in other country, same I uh, same topic I can conduct in my country. If a particular topic has been done in a country. And you now want to do the same research topic in your country. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. <laughs> Wait. Uh, the answer is yes and no. The answer is no because when if it is masters, 
if this master's research work, if yeah, somebody can say that, okay, they expect a limited amount of research components in your work. But if it is PhD, three things are essential. One, novelty. Novelty, meaning that what are you bringing to the table? What is new in your work? What is new that other people have not done? What are the new ideas you are bringing up? Novelty is very important. They don't joke with it. Two, methodology. Please mute yourself. Methodology. Methodology is very important. Your methods must be scientific. Your method, whatever method you'll be using in your research from data collection, data analysis, data representation, and the likes. All those methods must be scientific proven. And number three, number three is feedback. What are the responses? What are the way? Okay, because remember in your chapter one, you have to, you need to, you need to have some kind of objectives of your research. Those objectives in your last chapter, which is chapter five or anything, under your summary, you must bring them out one after the other and tell them that you have answered how you have answered each of those objectives in your research work, and that comes under feedback. So these three aspects are very essential. They don't joke with it when it comes to PhD work. Now, the reason why I said yes and no is because if you are not doing exactly what that person has done, whereby probably you want to change the methods or probably someone is using a particular algorithm and in your own case, you want to use that same algorithm plus additional algorithm. So you want to use some kind of hybrid method. Okay? In such, in such case, you can get it done. In that case, yes. In that case, yes. Because you are doing what the person has done. But again, you are extending what the person has done by introducing additional method to what he or she has done, okay? So as a result, you will be getting a better result that is better than what that person has done as a result of your addition, as a result of, as a result of the additional uh, methods or algorithm, okay? But, but if you want to do safety that that person has done, it is a no. He said, no, because yes, yeah, they may not know, okay? But anytime they get to know that that work has been done somewhere else, and it's still the same thing that that person has done, you may be sued even by the original author. Let's say you do it. Attendance link you sent this on December 8th. Attendance link you sent. Attendance li link you sent this on 8th December. It doesn't matter, that's just, just fill up. Okay, that's fine. Just fill up, yes. So, whether you, so Mitch, that's why I said yes and no. Yes, if you are improving on the method, on the approach that person uses, or probably that person uses a particular theory to do a survey. You may use a different theory, or you can use additional, you can add additional theory so that you make your own look different or even longer, or cover more, more target group. Okay, if that's what you're doing, you are good to go. But if you are doing this, you are repeating the same thing that that person has done, exactly the way he has done it, you can say no. If, because they will tell you that you are copying someone's idea, and if it is masters, um, they can say that, okay, you are only approaching the scope, is, the scope are not the same. But for PhD, they will penalize you. Okay, so don't do that unless you want to add your own part. Okay, I hope I, I hope I hope I have answered your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so any other question? Thank you, sir. 
Okay, so thank you. Stay safe and see you again next week. Bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you.